Welcome into Pete's Pigskin Preview, presented by Walk-On's Sports Bistro. I'm Neil McCready. I am not the star of this show. I am merely the resident village idiot who just sort of steers things. The star of this show is Pete DeWeese, our MPW Digital resident football expert. Pete was uh, kind of the headliner on last year's massive three-and-a-half-hour-a-week MPW Digital pregame show, which I evaluated from an analytical standpoint and thought, that's too long. But this, the subject of uh, Pete would start at the very beginning, and we would see a little bit of a fall-off, and that had nothing to do with the other guest. He just had to do with – it's hard to listen. If you're a Joe Rogan person, you know this. It is hard to listen to three-and-a-half-hour podcasts. So I said, you know what? Let's simplify this. Let's give the people what the people want, and that's Pete DeWeese who is back for another year of previewing Ole Miss football games. Pete will be with us on this show, his show, each and every week that Ole Miss has a game. We're taping this on Wednesday nights. I like like time-stamping things, Pete, because you never know what's going to happen, especially like a week like this one where Ole Miss hasn't named a quarterback yet. So we might talk in ambiguous terms there, and then something gets announced on Friday, and you're listening to this, and you're like, wait, what? We're taping this on Wednesday night. I'm going to publish it on Thursday. We're going to publish it on YouTube. This is probably going to be a show that is best viewed on YouTube, on our YouTube MPW digital channel, but we're also going to put it in podcast form. Uh, it's going to be my assignment to uh, sort of every once in a while, make sure that if you're listening while you're driving to Oxford or to Atlanta or to Baton Rouge or to College Station or to Fayetteville or to wherever else, Nashville, wherever Ole Miss plays a game this year and you're listening to the podcast, First of all, we appreciate that. Second of all, we're going to try to make it where if you're listening, you can kind of follow along in your mind's eye. But that's the plan. And we'll do it each and every week that Ole Miss has a football game. So at least 12 times and probably 13 times. And who knows, maybe 14 or 15 times. We'll see. Pete, how are you? I'm good. I I appreciate you having me back. I, um, you know, my studio is not as nice as the MPW Digital Studio in Oxford, and um, but I got a daughter trying to go to bed, and a neighbor's dog outside. But hopefully, that doesn't affect anything. Uh, I appreciate that warm introduction. I don't think anybody's called me a star since my mother, um, and, and I <laughs> lost that title probably around fifth grade when I started acting a little bit more myself. But um, you definitely well, I, lost it when you when you produced uh, the the grand the granddaughter because the granddaughter is now I well that, the she star. is fully the star. There's there's no <laughs> question about that. But yeah, I'm excited to be back. Um, you know, grateful that that we've got a group of people that want to listen. Grateful we we've got you guys and we have walk ons that want to help us put this on. And um, I'm looking forward as the, as the season goes on of hopefully being able to provide some good content. And um and some insight into to what goes on on the field and preparation, um and things that you can look for on a Saturday as you uh, you prepare for the game. I really appreciate the timestamp you threw out because um, I'm going to do enough to make myself look dumb sometimes. So you know when I say something on a Wednesday night and all of a sudden on Friday the Chinese buffet hits wrong and the kid doesn't touch the field on Saturday, right? Yeah, I can't fully be blamed for that. No, so but I'm, I'm excited. It's one of the things that came out of COVID. Most things that came out of COVID were really negative. One of the good things was that it gave you a reason to timestamp. And I've even in the post-COVID era, I've said, you know what, we should still timestamp. It's it's transparent and it explains to someone when they're driving or watching, or, wait, what? Because you know, nope, we I don't have the crystal ball. Because if I had a crystal ball, my ass would be in Vegas right now. No, uh, no, I mean. no, yeah. If if I could tell you right now who's gonna roll out there as QB one. Yeah, uh, I I would if I wasn't in Vegas, I would be in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and and I would be on the reservation. So there's no question. I took Carson to uh, to Vegas this summer, and we went into some of those big sports books, and I'm like, you know what, these things didn't build themselves. So I don't think any of the cats in there had crystal balls either. Uh, before we get rolling, I'm going to tell you about Walk Ons because they make this show possible. Walk On Sports Bistro puts everything they've got into bringing you game day with the taste of Louisiana. Dig into their mouth-watering, made-from-scratch Louisiana cuisine like po'boys, gumbo, voodoo shrimp, plus fan favorites like juicy burgers, fresh salads, all in front of 70-plus TVs, 40-plus ice-cold beers on tap. Visit them today in Oxford or Ridgeland if you're coming up for the game. You're going to be in Oxford for the next two and a half, three days. Make walk-ons a part of your weekend. And if you do, tell them that you appreciate them 
sponsoring Pete's Pigskin Preview. They're also jumping on the Oxford Exxon podcast starting on September 1st. So they're going to be a, uh, a big part of what we do at MPW Digital. They're also on the McCready and Siski uh, show as well. So a whole lot of uh, content coming your way throughout the course of the week, every week. And a lot of that is aided by our friends at Walk-On's Sports Bistro. All right, Pete, let's Let's jump into this a little bit with some general thoughts before we jump into Troy, because the truth is, no offense to Troy, if we're talking a whole lot about Troy next week, something went terribly wrong. So I look at these first two games for sure, and if I'm being honest, I look at the first four games as an opportunity to take a team that is a talented team, but a team that lost a lot of talent. I mean, look at the NFL cuts on – Wednesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning. Look at all of the guys that made NFL rosters. Sam Williams, uh, Mark Robinson, Chance Campbell, Dean Leonard, Jalen Jones. I say that surprisingly because I frankly was surprised. Snoop Connor, Matt Corral was going to make the the Panthers, obviously. He unfortunately suffered the list Frank injury in camp. Um, that's a lot of guys that made uh, teams. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm leaving one out. Uh, someone got cut and got put up. Uh, Maybe it was Braylon Sanders. I can't remember. Someone got cut and put on a, a practice squad today. So I think Drummond, maybe. I, I think I read that on the board just a little while ago. Okay, so a couple of guys. So, you know, that was a talented football team. You don't go 10-2 and two and go to the Sugar Bowl without being talented. They were well coached. They had great schemes, all that stuff. But you, it requires talent. Um, Clark Lee says hello. It, it requires talent. So they have to replace that talent. And I think they have brought in a ton of talent. But this leads to my question. Because I'm curious, because you coach high school teams that are ever changing. When you bring in talent from all of these different places, USC, Auburn, Mississippi State, Western Kentucky, um, UCF, SMU, TCU, Charlotte, um, hell, I don't know. I think I've made my point by now. Missouri. When you bring in all of those people from all of these different places that have these different cultures and different ways of doing things and different team rules and different priorities and all that stuff, how difficult do you think it would be to get chemistry, to get guys to gel, to get guys to buy in? It's it's hard to say specifically, right? I mean, because every group is is going to be different, but you know in a lot of ways it's driven by your culture that, that you've created in the program. And, and that's, I think to, to Kiffin's credit, whether you're a fan of the transfer portal and maybe, you know, how they recruit and the way that they've brought players in, they have made it a part of their culture that there's going to be constant competition and that they are always going to be trying to bring in people to improve that competition. And so when you look at a room now, you know, I, I read the the notes you guys had up on the site the other day um, with um, an interview from one of the running backs. And he's talking about, you know, there's not a main guy right now. We all show up to work every day. When you get high profile transfers to come into your program and in particular coming in, knowing there's already another one coming in and then you bring in a talented freshman and you've already got some kids on campus. Um, for those guys to come in and and publicly, if there's any sincerity in what they're saying, I think it shows you that that up front they're they're clear and defined with what the culture is, and that's you know one is is we're going to give you an opportunity, and if you earn it, it's there. Um, I think one of the big things that they've done since they've been there is they have shown a willingness to give the new guy a chance. Right, we we've seen players. You go back to Yaboa, right, when he comes over from Temple and immediately is an integral part of the offense. And so you look at, one, it speaks uh, to their evaluation of talent and, and understanding of fit of what they need on the roster. I think it also speaks to their ability to maximize talent, um, which is something that they definitely sell to kids. You don't get Michael Trigg unless you convince him, I know what to do with you to get you where you want to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, but ultimately I I think you also have to, you have to convince them of a culture that we're going to give you an opportunity to shine, but you're going to have to earn it. And you have to trust us because we're going to give multiple guys that opportunity. When you look at last year's backfield and you're talking about 
three running backs that played pretty consistently. And and some fans wanted more Snoop Connor and some fans, you know, wanted Parrish and some, you know, wanted more Ely. But they managed to play all three and they found the things that they all did well. Um, so I, I think that when you build that culture, somebody's always going to get upset. It's just reality. Um, but But when you build that culture and the expectation is – and it goes back, I think, ultimately to that that pro mindset that we heard Kiffin talk a lot about when they first got there, that if your goal is to play in the NFL, and that's what the goal is for every college football player, and for very few it happens, but but that's the goal, right? And so when you talk about pro mindset, part of it is you come and earn a paycheck, and the day that you're not serviceable, that paycheck's gone. Yeah, and And so finding a way to shape and craft that culture in a positive way um, there's just so many different things at play, but from the outside looking in, it seems that Kiffin and his staff have done that, you know, and the way that they continue to get guys to buy in and come play, um, it, it certainly seems that they've been effective in getting that message across that we're going to make you compete, but if you earn it, you're going to be rewarded by it. I'm almost super hesitant to go where I'm about to go. And so I'm probably going to steer you in and steer you out pretty quick because <laughs> it makes me nervous. Um, and I like both kids. I've met both kids. I, I've talked to them. Uh, they're both exemplary young men, best I can tell. This quarterback thing, I would assume as a coaching staff, you want one of the guys to just go win the job. You just want a guy to just go take it where it's obvious to everybody and you know it. And there's no – like Chad Kelly, when he came to Ole Miss, it was like, okay, we can talk about a competition all we want, but he's the quarterback. And everybody knew it, including the other guys who were competing against him. In this case, listen, I take Lane Kiffin at his word. Lane Kiffin is not a coach speak guy. For You can have whatever you think of Lane, and I've gotten where I really um, enjoy covering him. But one of the things that I like about covering him is that I don't get a lot of coach speak. If he doesn't want to answer a question, he just won't. If it's a bad question, he'll kind of spit on it. And if it's a good question, he will give you a thoughtful answer. And when you ask quarterback questions this year, and I think we've been fair as a media group as we ask the questions, I don't think we've asked him any gotcha stuff or tried to pin him down. I think we've been more than fair, and he's treated us respectfully with his answers. I'm not convinced that he exactly knows who his quarterback is. From a from a team dynamic, I'm curious, is that a big deal inside a team when they don't know who's going to play the most high-profile position on the field? You know, I I here's what I, I can tell you. I mean, I certainly wasn't a player in the locker room. Um when when Eli graduated and you roll in the next year and you have Robert Lane on on the roster at Ole Miss, you have Michael Spurlock, you have Ethan Flat, and you have a group of guys that are competing for it. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, there's cliques on every team, there's friend groups on every team, and there's certainly guys that that would like to see their guy sure. be the guy. Sure. Um, the flip side of that is, is everybody wants to win. And unless the players, you know, there's always going to be friendships, like we said, but unless the players think that there's clearly a guy, they won't see somebody separate themselves. Um, you know, you, you go back and you look at the quote uh, last week from what, from one of the defensive backs and he says, I can't, what I, I don't know who it should be. I picked them both off, yeah, right? Too. Like, yeah. what what a great answer. And yeah. and who knows if he got clapped back by the coaching staff for making that statement. I hope that he didn't. I don't think I, he did because the rest of that quote was, and you know this well, right? Because you can simulate a season opener and stuff like that, but at some point in camp, the offense knows what the defense is doing. The, defense, the defense knows what the offense is doing. That's if right. Andre Prince, you've guarded Jonathan Mingo so many times now. You've guarded uh, Malik Heath so many times now. You you know everything about their game and vice versa. And so your eyes are yeah. You're a defender <laughs> and your eyes aren't manipulated the same way. You know what you know what route stems look like and 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 then the flip side of that too. And this has been the thing about the quarterback competition that from afar, right? Is is one seems to like taking a little bit more chance and maybe getting yeah. himself in a little bit more trouble. So, you know, and, and the other is a little bit more conservative, but because of that maybe isn't as explosive. 
And so when, when you're those players sitting there and, and you are in that position where you have seen it a million times and there's days where the defense is going to go out and they're going to flat out perform the offense. And then there's days where the offense is going to go out and outperform the defense. And, and it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter if one side of the ball, once the season gets started, is clearly better than the other. That happens in practice. Yeah. Um, it, it, at least most teams that I've ever been around or, or been a part of. And so I, I think um, I, I don't I, – I would hate to speculate and say that it, it, it could divide the locker room because, again, going back to the culture piece of and the whole pro mindset is we are playing to win, right? And if, if one kid gives us the chance to win, that, that, that's who we're going to play. Um, you know, and, and, and in today's era – um, where guys are in and then guys are out and the new guys in. I, I just think with with what we've seen, I think kids are a little bit more accustomed to it. You know, when, when I talk to guys um, that, that I've coached or, or, or that have maybe home from college and they end up training at our place in the summer and you talk to them a little bit, it's it's just such a different world. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, it, it's more of a business than it ever has been. It's always been a business, but it's more so one now than it ever has been. And and the the idea that we have to win is so much more important now. Um, so I, I think that ultimately the, the players probably have reason to believe both of them give them a chance. If, if they didn't feel – if the coaching staff didn't feel like one of them is ready, then Ole Miss would be in a world of hurt. I don't ever get that vibe that, that hey, neither one of them are good enough. It's always – we just need one to take control. We need one to do this, one to do that, and somebody to step up. And sometimes you can't tell until the lights come on how that's going to play out. And I think the kids probably know that too. And they're both 19. But, but both, both 19 years old and, and, you know, sophomores in college living, living that life. And some nights you stay up a little later than others and you show up the next day and maybe you don't practice as well. I mean, that's, that's the reality of college football. Yeah, it happens. All right, let's talk about this game on Saturday. Ole Miss uh, and Troy, season opener for both teams. Uh, Troy, first-year coach John Summerall, former Ole Miss assistant, former Kentucky assistant, incredibly well thought of in the uh, coaching world. I think uh, high school coaches have a lot of respect for John Summerall. It's Lane Kiffin's third season, but it's two new coordinators. DJ Durkin left for uh, Texas A&M, and um, uh, Jeff Levy, of course, left for Oklahoma. So it's Charlie Weiss Jr. in from uh, South Florida as the offensive coordinator for Ole Miss. And uh, Chris Partridge, who's been the co-coordinator with Dirk in the first two years, is now the guy calling the shots for Ole Miss. Maurice Crum also has that title of co-defensive coordinator. We'll start on the Ole Miss end, then I'll ask you about Troy in a minute because I want to get to that in a second because scouting for a first-year staff is probably problematic. But for Ole Miss, do you, how different do you expect the offense to be under Weiss? And uh, do you expect the defense to be a lot different with Partridge as opposed to Durkin? From an offensive standpoint, you know, I, I went back this week and just rewatched some of the the spring game just on YouTube um, and, and and buzzed through it. And, and you know, there's one, it's the spring game. They're not going to show everything. They're going to run their base stuff. And everything you saw are, are the type of things that you saw in games last year. It's not going to be an, a major overhaul of the system. I mean, Jeff Lebby certainly had his thumbs on, on the system and, and and played a huge role in, in developing the success that Ole Miss has had on offense in the last couple of years. But it's not like Lane Kiffin wasn't in the room. It's not like Kiffin wasn't a part of, of you know, designing the call sheet and scripting things out and, and calling plays on a Saturday. Um, I, I think, you know, you go back and – I had done before Kiffin got to Ole Miss and when he was with Weiss Jr. Um, in South Florida um, at Florida Atlantic, I had gone in and, and done a study of what they were doing because I, I really liked the way that they were playing ball. They were clearly effective and they were doing things against sometimes against teams with better competition and, and finding a way to, to, to create success. And a lot of those same things transferred to Ole Miss, even with Lebby. Um, there was a blend of maybe what Levy had been at UCF and then what Kiffin had, had brought from, from his experience. And so I, I don't think you're going to see a major shift. I think the shift you saw from the Elijah Moore, uh, Yaboa, that, that group, right, 
into last year was the involvement of the tight end looked different. You didn't have the kid that was going to be as effective out wide. You didn't have a tight end that was going to stretch you down the middle the same. So now you add number zero, right? You add trig to the equation. And I think we and see number 19 too. This Kyron yeah, Heath. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm I'm not, a, you haven't had a chance to see him. I think you're going to love him. He, he's now he's physically not ready to be a blocker at this level yet. I don't think which is going to eliminate some of the surprise element with him because when they put him out in the slot, let's face it, they're throwing the ball. But he is he's a strong route runner, good hands, athletic. He's a kid. Keep an eye on him down the road. When he gets a year in a college weight room and gets bigger, stronger, and can handle himself a little better physically, it's not like he's weak. Don't get me wrong. He kicked my ass. But my, my point is, is that you put him up against a – SEC 275 pound defensive end, and my money's on the end right now. But a, I, a year from now, two years from now, look out. He's a guy to watch. I, I think, you know, th that's you add him to the equation, and, and you know, the depth at tight end looks completely different right now than it did yeah. at any point last season, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and until somebody separates, we don't know exactly what the wide receiver core is going to look like, but the depth there right now looks yeah. promising. Sure. And I, so I, I think one of the things you'll see out of Ole Miss is is last year, most more often than not, the tight end was attached to the box down by the line, not flexed out a ton. They did it some, especially later in the season, as wide receiver injuries played a role in who they had available to them. Um, but early in the season, when the wide receivers were still a little bit healthy, tight end was out of the game. It's four real, real, real wide receivers. From what I see and, and hear and read on the site is, is they're going to have the ability to, to shift personnel and, and formation structure and keep those tight ends on the field because of their athleticism. The flip side of that is they're going to be able to play with multiple tight ends, mm -hmm. and that's going to change the way you have to personnel defensively and the things you do defensively. So you have to prepare for an offense now – they can put two tight ends on the field and potentially potentially create extra run gaps. Um, and at the same time, those same two kids can now go out wide. And if you're stuck with an extra D lineman, an extra linebacker in a more traditional, not a sub package, because now you see teams that are that are playing, you know, there's so much four, two, five, even in three, four, you're seeing teams where one of those outside linebackers is becoming more of a nickel. And Ole Miss has certainly played that way last year defensively and you see other teams around the country doing it, the fact that now you can take the same bodies, get into four wide, and then next play jump into two tight or tight end fullback type situation, um, it can put strain defensively. Um, you know, it, there are certain teams with talent that it's Alabama. that They'll do what they want, right? Yeah, sure, of course. But for the most part, a lot Very of teams good. now yeah. you have to make a decision, hey, when they go to this package, are we going to put the big body on and, and take care of the two extra gaps? Or are we going to keep the nickel in the game? Because as soon as they start putting trig down the field, we have to have somebody there for them. So it certainly opens up, I think, the possibility. Um, you know, you go back and you look at what Kiffin and Weiss did together. Um, and and I think their last year, what tight end won the won the award for the Mackey Award or whatever for the nation's top tight end. But there were times where they played with two. And, and now having the ability to do that. Um, I think gives them a, a, another feather in their cap. And, and if you're in a situation where your quarterback is still trying to get comfortable or you're trying to protect him from the standpoint of don't make, let him make a ton of mistakes, having those big bodies that you can both use in the run game but also get them out into routes on play action and things of that nature um, can really be a quarterback's best friend. And it's, it's one of those things that you hear – Announcers talk about all the time, but but there's a lot of truth to it because they can create matchup problems. And so I think from that standpoint, you're going to see the tight end used more like Yaboa was two years ago. And and that that'll be one of the biggest shifts, I think, is is how we see that, that position be more versatile than we saw it last year. Um, if if Ole Miss can stay healthy out wide, um, you know, they have so many so many kids they can play with and do different things. By the end of the season, Ole Miss was using a ton of motion from the receivers. If you go back and watch the Mississippi State game, 
they would take one of the receivers, start him out wide, motion him into the backfield, and then send him back out again. And it's all about manipulating the defense, getting them to tip off the coverage, giving the quarterback easy reads for RPO and quick game and things like that. And, and now with some of the, the athletic ability of some of the kids that Ole Miss seems to have, the, the kid from Central Florida, right? In, Jalen Robinson. J.J. Right, yeah. J. J. Henry, who's had a better camp than Robinson. Right? Uh, it, that's, you take those two kids, and are they Elijah Moore? I would not stamp them that right now. I mean, that wouldn't be fair to them. Um, but they give you the ability to do a lot of those type of things. And then when out wide, you're looking at Malik Keith and you're looking at Jonathan Mingo and these big body receivers, there is potential for Ole Miss to create mismatches all over the field against a lot of football teams. Yeah, and really gifted backs. Um, Evans, Bentley, Judkins, man, Judkins. I mean, Judkins he, is Judkins is the deal. I mean, you he know, does not he does not look like a like like his age. I mean, yeah, he, he's. I mean, I, the last time I hyped up a freshman running back, I, I'll never hear the end of it. So I'm I'm being careful here. But but Judkins reminds me of a couple of guys that are. I just stopped there. He reminds me of a couple of guys. So um, I don't want to do that to him. I don't just well. I I will say this. He reminds me a little bit of one that you probably covered when you covered another SEC school. Yeah. And that young man is now coaching at that same school. Yeah. But he reminds me very much of him. A slightly more physical version of him. And that dude That's high that praise. Dude, that dude was a that dude was a player. And still looks like it, by the way. He does, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Saw um, him in the spring. <laughs> by the NIL money he would have made. Holy <laughs> um <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, money? but I don't know if he and his teammate would have stayed in the same backfield for three years with well, under this current current climate. There's no way they would have. Yeah, there was there were times when that backfield was so stacked. Brandon Jacobs was on the same roster. Oh yeah, um, who played for the Giants? You know, yep. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. Um, all right, let's. I think we talked about defense. Partridge, do you expect a big difference with Partridge and and Durkin? <laughs> you know, so. I, I really don't know. And, and, and here's the kind of, I guess, the biggest thing I would say is um, Ole Miss was really good last year at being able to play their base defense and be selective about when they pressured. I don't know Partridge. I know that he spent a lot of time with Don Brown at University of Michigan. Don Brown is known. I mean, his the most famous Don Brown quote out there is solve all your problems with aggression. And everything is about pressure. Um with the bodies that Ole Miss has, you know, in the front and in the secondary, um, they have the ability to be multiple. And if if there is concern about the second level of your defense, yeah, one of the ways you protect those guys is by being aggressive, right? Yeah. Both in your in your coverage technique and in in how you move and stunt and and get guys going. And so, if there's anything, I wouldn't be surprised. Because uh, the other thing, Don Brown, I mean, he he based out of an odd stack, a three three stack most of the time, but it was it was it was never static. It was constantly the front changed constantly, and and last year Ole Miss had the ability to be somewhat static, and a lot of that was because some of the guys that they had sort in the edge, and some of those guys are back, and so you know, can they still play that game if they're as good in the interior as I think they think they will be. Yeah, I think they're going to be pretty good interior. And I think they're good on the edge, too. I think Cedric's going to have a big year. I, I like what I've seen out of Tavius Robinson. I don't know that he's Sam Williams, but not many guys are. <laughs> the, the, the concern, and, and, and I feel bad doing this because I've built a relationship with Troy Brown. And I like Troy, and Troy's confident that he's going to be a good player, and I think he is going to be. The thing is, is you look back on last season, and there's a certain degree of hindsight on this. Chance Campbell played 900 and some odds plus snaps and chance just made the Tennessee Titans roster. Um, Mark Robinson came on in the second half, second two thirds of the season and was a beast. And I don't know because Sam was playing so great. I don't know that we fully acknowledged how impactful Mark was on old Mrs. Defense a year ago. And, and Mike Tomlin came to Oxford in March or April or whenever the hell that was March, I think. And, and watched Pro Day, and you could see him buying in. on, And they, and they stole him in the sixth round of the NFL draft, and Mark's going to play in the Bengals – I'm sorry, in the Steelers opener against the Bengals on September the 11th or 12th, whatever that is. And 
you got to replace those guys, Pete. And it, it, it's just that the other the other people, you know, if if Austin Keys can stay healthy, he's incredibly athletic. He's he's a guy that looks like an Alabama linebacker. He just hasn't been able to stay on the field. Ashanti Sistrunk's been around a while, and he's solid. Don't know that anybody's going to accuse him of being a, a a star. He's just a good player. Um, you know, they've got the, the the transfer Coleman from Georgia Tech who has has had some moments. Um, and then you have Troy Brown, who's a, a really good player at Central Michigan, who you're asking, hey, come in and be this vocal leader in an SEC defense, all while adjusting to this speed of play. It, it just, it's a big assignment, right? And I'm not saying they won't pass this test, and they're studied, they're studied for it. I mean, to, to to follow that analogy all the way through, but you just don't know until you go sign up, until you sit down and t- get the exam and start taking it. No, and and that's the big thing is is you know athletically Campbell and Robinson, like what those guys there's, and this is not a knock on them. It's the sec. There's more of those around, right? Yeah, sure. What you saw, we've talked a lot on this show in the past. And we talked even a couple of years ago when nobody was allowed in the stadium and we're doing this thing live in the second quarter. And, And we talked about the importance of communication and how so much of what modern offenses do is force you to communicate right up until the ball snapped. And, and when you watched Ole Miss play last year from the Louisville game, and it never changed, Chance Campbell never stopped talking. Yeah. He, he, and he wasn't the only one. The guys on the back end were seasoned and doing a lot of the same stuff at the safety position. Springer. They Ole Miss played those safeties last year. It was so crucial to their success. But there was so much communication going on on the field. The leadership was evident. The communication was evident. The, the the way that he diagnosed plays, and it's why he probably made the Titans. There are guys that are bigger than him and faster than him and stronger sure. than him, but he plays the game in a very cerebral manner that always is going to give him a chance to play faster, bigger, and stronger than he is. And and again, that's not a knock on his ability by any means. Of course not. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. But, but the truth is, for a lot of great players, that is – probably as big of a key for great players as true athleticism is outside of certain freak positions, but at linebacker and O-line and certain positions, that ability changes everything. I mean, Lord Tom Brady, everybody's seen the the videos from, from the combine. I mean, he's, he's never wowed anybody with his athleticism, but it's the way he plays the game up here. It, it's, it's elite. And, you know, not to make the comparison between, Brady and and Campbell, but, but he played the game and he was such a smart player. So the question with Ole Miss to me is it's not about the physical attributes. Who do they have that can make the calls, make the adjustments and keep everybody on the same page. And so you look at Sam Williams and you look at the loss of a truly elite pass rusher. I mean, and I've watched him a little bit in the preseason. I mean, he, the kid, I, I, I really hope he has an amazing career don't know him, never met him, but but with him having his little girl and everything of his story that I know, I really want to see him be successful. He's a great he's a great story. Lane said this the other day. He is the poster child for what it is that they're trying to recruit to. That hey, if you come here and you buy in, and you let us get you to grow up on and off the field, because Sam had a lot of growing up to do off the yeah. field. He did. He had a lot. It's the reason that he went in the second round and not the first. Um, and that's fair. It is what it is. It's a business. Um, but man, he, he matured so much. I I couldn't believe it last year. The first time that he did a media thing with us. I mean, I I looked down like, is this somebody else? (laughs) I did. I looked down. I was like, is this somebody else? Who could this be that looks like this? And because this is not Sam, because Sam was used to be gruff and short and, and suddenly he's this open, thoughtful, uh, communic- communicative guy talking about his little girl, his little boy, I meant, and, and, and it just, everything just changed. And, and he owned everything that happened. He talked about it. And, and then he had a beast of a season. Oh my God. He had a beast of a season. I, I he had a beast of a season. He, he dominated the second half of that season in a way that, whew, I mean, he earned the all American thing. He was special. Well, and, and, you know, one thing and it about, his growth, but you look at the change in Matt Corral while he's in Oxford, 
And, and you think about some of the other stories of, of individuals that, that we know on the roster. And, and obviously, they're stories that, that, that are going to lean the other way a little bit, too. Sure. There's some credit that has to go, whether it goes to the coaching staff or the kids in the locker room. Like, we've heard about the get real Wednesdays or whatever they called them when they would have those meetings. That, that type of growth, we as coaches, we, we want, especially at the high school level, right? We want to romanticize the role that we play in developing young men. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's, it may not always seem like that when we're screaming and hollering, but it is important to almost everyone I know in my profession, at least the people that I tend to, to, to cohort with and, and the people that I've been fortunate enough to work with. Sure. And I've known a lot of guys at the college level that truly feel the same way, but it is different for them. Yeah. You know? And, and so I think, though, when, when you look at some of the individual growth of players in that locker room, and again, it goes back to that, that talk of culture. I, I saw the video right before I got on here of, you know, KD calling his mom to tell her he won the Chucky Mullins board. Yeah. And everybody on the board's like, oh, man, there's tears. Well, I wiped my eyes before I got on the Zoom. <laughs> because as a fan, he appears to be the type of character that you want to represent your university. Absolutely. And as a parent, it's that's the success you want to see your kids have. Of course. And as, and as a coach, it that that same passion and determination, that that's what you want to see out of your players. Yeah. And, and so that exists somewhere in that program and how much of that left with those kids, if it was an individual thing, or if it is rooted in something that the staff was doing or that the kids found themselves in those get real meetings. Um, it, it certainly played a role in the way that they played the game. And so, you know, it's funny. I think it's a, it's a credit to a lot of people. I think it's a credit to Matt Luke and Tyler Siski and the staff that brought those kids in that saw something in those guys at a time when it was difficult to recruit to Ole Miss for a lot of reasons. And it's obviously a credit to Lane Kiffin and his staff that they've been able to take a kid like Katie Hill, who's limited physically and uh, get what they've gotten out of him. And he and, and it's, then it's obviously a credit to KD and the kids in, inside that program because you can't make a kid, you know this, you can't make a kid be a leader. You, you can't make a kid be, you, you can't make a kid study. You can't make a kid do the extra film. You, you, you can't make a kid desire it. You can't make someone feel that emotion and that, Everyone has his or her why, right? You can't make them discover the why. They have to do it on their own. It has to happen that way. You can encourage and you can cajole and stuff, but you can't make it. It's a credit to a lot of people, but I think it's also like full circle and where we've gone so far is it tells you why Lane's a little, um, you know, not not, not hesitant because, I mean, he joked with me the other day. He said, you know, I, I, I say, I say my, thankful prayers or whatever every morning and the first thing i think i'm thankful for is the transfer portal i mean obviously that's he's thankful for other things in his life other than the transfer portal he was being he was trying to be funny but he's thankful for the transfer portal that being said i think he knows that when you bring in a lot of these guys that last year what made that team special in so many ways was matt corral's journey i hate that word but i just used it sam williams katie hill um, Snoop Connor, right? Ontario Drummond, all these guys that had been there for a while, and it had not always been, you know, a um, just a, a follow the yellow brick road. It had, it, it there had been some thorns and some snakes and some stuff, and they'd had to overcome it. And uh, you know, even before that, Elijah Moore, right? I mean, he he basically gets a staff fired, and and then he and then he you know has that season. There's a lot there, and and so when you bring in transfer portal guys from different places through no fault of their own, they're not ingrained in the culture of your program. And so you've got to get them to get in quick. I, I think an interesting question that, that I don't know enough to, to debate and, and you would know more than me is, 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 and you, you've, you've hit it at it recently and he's hit, said it himself. There's been change in Kiffin but openly Sure. You've seen change in, in you see it in the social media presence. You, you it it's evident. Yeah. Has has the the development of those kids played a role in his change, or has his change played a role in the oh, development of those kids? That's a great question, Pete. Um be, because 
in a lot of ways, again, from the outside looking in, I think you can find some parallels between the growth and change in Corral and what you see in Kiffin. Um, because ultimately any team, there's always going to be a nature of individualism. It, just, it is what it is. It's how we're wired. But the flip side of that is a common goal is a common goal. I mean, and when you start to reach that goal together, a lot of things can happen. And so, you know, I, I, I would not pretend to say that there, I know any answers or I, but I, but I, I have wondered about that. Um, because I, I do think that as things started to shift and success started to become part of what they were doing and the way that kids were handling themselves in the media and presumably off the field, um, you, you see some of the same shifts happening for other people in the program, not just players. Let's shift to Troy. By the way, I've shared my screen, so if you want to take at any point, do anything, go for it. If you don't, that's fine too. Whatever. I, we, we're This is – Again, show number one, and we're, I think, in many ways gearing up for October the 1st. That's what I think. So, But we'll obviously talk about all these teams. So let's talk about Troy. Um, John Summerall's first-year coach. He was at Kentucky the last few years. Kentucky's had real success. Uh, he's hired a staff, a good staff of good young coaches, recruiters, that kind of thing. I mean, he's done a really nice job putting a staff together there at Troy. And Lane Kiffin was asked earlier in the week, how do you kind of get ready for them? And Lane said it's – I thought Lane gave a great answer. He, he said kind of hard because you go back and you look at Kentucky film and you catch yourself looking at the Kentucky players because when we watch a football game, we watch players. And the kids that play at Kentucky don't play at Troy. And so you're looking at scheme, but you want to look at players, and then you watch the Troy film – and you see some of the players, but you see think to yourself, but they're going to play in a completely different scheme. And then on offense, uh, Troy's brought in a couple of transfer portal quarterbacks. Who knows what? who's going to run, who's going to play, whatever. They've got one kid that was there last year, but it's going to be a, a different scheme. So it's a difficult thing to prepare for in terms of getting ready. And the fallback answer, and it's the correct one, is, look, what we have to do is make sure we do what we do well and then adjust as we can and that kind of thing. But I'll ask you as a coach, how difficult do you think this has been in Oxford this week, sort of trying to figure out what it is you're trying to get your kids prepared for for Saturday? You know, I, I think they had they they have some idea. I, you know, um, I'm looking at my notes right now and and some of the things. And you, you talk about the staff that that he did bring in. You know, I mean, Joe Craddock was was the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach. I mean, he was Chad Morris's baby and 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 was what I think youngest coordinator in the country yeah. and then NCAA at SMU went together to Arkansas. And I, I don't, I don't know. They didn't have the same success at Arkansas that they had at SMU. But and a lot mean? of that was trying to turn a roster over. They didn't have the roster. Necessarily they took it. over the Brett Bielema roster and tried yes. to go, Hey, we're going to go basically fun and gun or air raid with this roster that Brett Bielema had built to be, we're going to pound you into submission. It's it's frankly not to get on Arkansas at all, but it's frankly where Sam Pittman's been a miracle worker because he sort of take has taken a little bit of that and a little bit of this and turned it into something that's kind of worked. And while he's yeah. building his own culture with with Kendall and stuff, it, it's interesting. Yeah, you know, BM wanted to play with two and three tight ends and big bodied wide receivers and play a real physical brand of football. The and total antithesis of what Chad wanted to yeah, do. Yeah. Chad gets there and it's one tight end, maybe. And it's let's get On faster. Occasion. And yeah. and there's only so much of that speed to be found in Northwest Arkansas. And 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 you're competing against a lot of other teams, obviously for for kids. And then, you know, Sam gets there and, and he and you know he and Kendall find a way to kind of bridge the the two. Right. And 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 have done a good job. But you know, Craddock is He's been successful. He's he's from Alabama, I think. Um, he, they are going to try to run the football. And you look last year, they were not a good running football team. Um, their, their starting running back is from Marietta High School right down the road. They're a team that's in our region. I remember I was not at the current school I'm at now, at Hillgrove, when, when he was at Marietta. Um, but I remember him. He, he's a 5'8 on a good day with cleats on concrete. Yeah. Um, 215, 220 pound running back. And he, he's a good player. Um, you know, 
how effective can that offensive line in front of him be? You know, for, but from a standpoint of, of preparation from the staff, they're able to look at Arkansas film. They're able to look at some of the SMU film and, um, and, and identify some of those things, you know, um, and, and see where they think, uh, where they think they're going to lean. And, and so the quarterback situation, I mean, you know, I, my understanding is the quarterback played some last year. So you, you get an indication of maybe what some of his strengths are. Um, you know, the, the, the tight ends coach at, at Troy is, is actually a friend of mine's a guy named Evan McKissick. Um, he's got a background with the offensive line play. Uh, he's coached running backs. Um, Evan's a good football coach. And I've not talked to him about this game and I, sitting here thinking I should have texted him just to see if I could get anything <laughs> out of him. Um, but, you know, Evan was was with John Schlarman, um, who was the offensive line coach at Kentucky that passed away a couple years ago. Yeah. John was a phenomenal man, great football coach. Um, and, and so he has that relationship, um, you know, with, uh, with Summerall to, to end up in Troy. But, you know, you talk about the rest of that stuff. He brought an offensive line coach that spent six years on staff with the Patriots. Um, so you're looking at a lot of young coaches, but a lot of experienced coaches that are going to be yeah. able to pull a lot of things in. So I think if you're Ole Miss, that's probably where most of the concern comes from is, you know, you, you have a lot of guys that pull experience from a lot of different places. And the last time we've seen Craddock call an offense – maybe wasn't with a personnel grouping that, that truly fit what he wanted to do. Question is, does he have that personnel grouping now? You know, so that there, there, there is some, some slight concern there. Um, you know, from a talent standpoint, I would certainly think Ole Miss feels, feels good about things. I would hope that they do. Uh, <laughs> defensively with Troy, you have a defensive minded head coach um, that, that has an identity as a head coach who then goes out and hires a guy who's been a successful defensive coordinator. And so, you know, if you're looking at Kentucky's defense and you're looking at Army's defense from the past couple of years, where their defensive coordinator came from, um, you know, you're probably trying to figure out, okay, where's the similarity? What differences do we see? And wh where does that bridge, you know? Um, I, I'll say this, coming out of camp, I think one thing, when you look at the way that Ole Miss plays defense, I do think they're going to be very multiple. And, and having the ability in camp to play a multiple defense that gives you multiple looks helps the growth of your kids. You know, if – I haven't been to a practice, obviously, but if Ole Miss is playing some snaps with three down linemen and some snaps with two down linemen and two stand-up linebackers on the edge, and then the next snap there's four or five guys down hand in the dirt, um, from what I read and what I – hear about the personnel they have the ability to do those things they do I, I expect from what i've seen i don't they told us you know hey don't report on schemes okay so I, and i didn't so i'll be careful here because i want to respect their wishes um there's a lot of the three two six base because they've got so many dbs who can yes play, right um but I think they're deep enough on the defensive line for the first time that they can do some four traditional four two, four three four four two five. It kind of depends on how you define that Otis Reese, Ladarius Tennyson position. If you want to call it a safety, it's fine. If you want to call it a DB, it's, I'm cool with it. If you want to call it a linebacker, he's kind of lined up like a linebacker, and I'm cool with that too. I mean, that's terms. I don't know that the terms really matter. The offense is going to point at guys and they're going to do their count thing. Yep. And I suspect they'll count them as sort of a linebacker, but whatever. Um, they're multiple. They're more multiple, I think, than they've been in the past. I think you're right. I think they're going to be more aggressive than they've been in the past. I think in part because, as you as you astutely put it, it's he comes from that Don Brown school. And I think it's also because they feel like, and no one's told me this, this is me guessing, and look, I'm a football idiot. I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, I think it's because there's a, there's some concern about linebacker play, like at least early, that we got to protect these guys. We there, there's, there's concern about if teams get to the second level with good running backs, that you can, you can do things, that uh, you can get these guys. You, 
Ole Miss has these four linebackers I think they trust right now, and they're all different players. And they're going to have to mix and match, and teams are going to get them on film, and they're going to be able to scheme them a little bit. And I think I think Chris and Maurice know that. I don't know that. They've never told me that, I'm guessing. But, yeah, I think it's going to be a little different defensive look it, it, for two reasons. And the big one, the, one's positive, one's negative. I think the positive is obviously they're better up front. J.J. Pegues is a beast. Um, Iton is, as you might expect, he and Gordon, they look like the JUCO guys who have had the year. You know what I'm talking about? The first yep. year, they look like they're lost. And the second – end of the first year, they're like, oh, they're coming along. And then here in the yep. second year, it's like, they're they're here now. They're there. Tavius Robinson looks good. There's some young guys there. That there's, there's, you know, Taiwan Malone. There's some other guys that I think are going to be able to give them something and maybe as the year goes on, be able to give them a little bit more. And then who knows? Look, linebacker might pan out. I mean, Troy's a good player, and and you know, uh, Coleman's a good player. It, it might Keys might stay healthy and turn into an All SEC beast. Who knows? And if that happens, then sky's the limit. But if if that doesn't happen, I think you're going to see this massage throughout the year of how to kind of cover for those guys a little bit. It's as you were talking about. It's the defensive equivalent of, hey, we've got a quarterback that we like, but we don't want to throw a whole lot at him yet. We don't want him to lose his confidence. We don't want him to have that four pick game where it's in his head. We we want to just sort of just massage him, bring him along, get him going, get him confident. Then we'll take some shots later. I think it's kind of like that on the defensive side. And this is where for Ole Miss, I love their schedule. If their schedule were sort of inverted, I would not feel good about where this team is right now. But because the schedule is where it is, I think they've got a month to figure some things out before Kentucky comes to town and things get super real in, in SEC play. Well, and yeah, that, I agree with you. I mean, they the schedule does set up nicely for them to to learn some things about who they are. You know, and, and back to the kind of versatility, I, I think this is one thing I didn't mention earlier when you talk about the defenses. Their size and physicality at corner yeah. changes the way they can do some things. Wait till you, you see get, this kid play. Oh, I, I, I am beyond excited about it. I just, um, but I, I think that the players they have, not just at safety, but but at the corner position, yeah. allows them to take some risk and again, maybe protect those linebackers and protect the middle of the defense a little bit. Um, and and so, you know, you go back to preparing for Troy. If you're an Ole Miss offense, it's been all a camp facing those kids defensively at Ole Miss that are being that are giving you aggression that, that are giving you multiple looks that are making you change your count and identify guys and doing different things coverage wise that increases your development as an offense plain yeah. and simple yeah yeah it's it's why well, I think Troy's a, a really good first opponent because next week will be a little lesser opponent and then the third week you'll get a road trip and you get Georgia Tech and you're there you can tell me more about them as we get closer but and Tulsa will be a, a, a test, but you get a buildup. And then, I mean, look, the league, it, it's, duh, the SEC's better. Um, you know, Kentucky is a program that has really high hopes. Mark Stoops is, whether he's right or wrong, we'll find out, right, Pete? But but he is he is woolly and bullish on this team. Uh, he, he likes this team. And then Vanderbilt's better. I'm not going to be the guy that goes, oh, Vanderbilt's going to be – I'm not doing that. It's not what I'm saying, but they're better. Clark's going to do a good job at Vanderbilt. I don't know about Auburn. And then after Auburn, it's just a rolling ball of butcher knives. I mean, it's road trips and Alabama and the Egg Bowl. And, I mean, we, we'll get to all this as the year goes on. But anybody who looks at those last five games and goes, oh, yeah, we got this. Hey, I'm, I'd, I'd like to sign up for your positivity class because yeah, I, I – I, I, If you're Ole Miss, you hope you make it to October 15th healthy. Yeah, healthy I mean, on a roll, right? And and I think that's a possibility. I mean, I really do. I you think get it's to Auburn healthy. Yeah, all bets are off. Need to be. Yeah, if you get out of LSU healthy, you're where you have to be. Yeah, I and mean, then, that's just reality. And you know, I mean, the people that are like, "Hey, could they be eight and zero after eight? Sure, absolutely. And that's the fun part about this season is you could be eight and four, eight and zero, and end up eight and four. Or you could be eight and zero and end up eleven and one. I I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it's ultimately the big question is, is you know, we this team doesn't yet have an identity, and and they do have a lot of young talent that, that has not fully proven itself. 
Um, so, you know, like you talked about earlier, how do they gel when you bring in all these guys from the outside? That's going to be the most interesting thing. And, and, and you know, Ole Miss is not going to know that in these first two games. They're, yeah. They're not. Um, might they find some things out at Georgia Tech? Maybe. Maybe a little bit at Tulsa. But the reality is it may be October 1st before Ole Miss truly finds their identity. Yeah, because that game, if Kentucky beats Florida, that's an if. I think they will, personally. If Kentucky beats Florida, that's going to be a big national game. It's going to be two four no teams that will be ranked somewhere around, let's see, Kentucky's 20 and Ole Miss is 21 right now, so they'll be ranked somewhere in the 12-13 range. That'll be a it won't be the headline national game, but it'll be way up there. And it, it could easily it. be the two thirty CBS. It could easily be the the, the eight PM ESPN. And and again, you're talking about a team that does seem to be a little bit of a media darling right now in Kentucky. Yeah. And and you're talking about an Ole Miss team that if it starts four and zero with with the persona that Lane is, and and let's not leave Juice out of the conversation, <laughs> right? But yeah, um, for sure you're talking about a really potentially a really big day in Oxford. Yeah. Two, uh, two social media darlings, uh, Will Levis, Juice Kiffin. I mean, who knows what, what goes down on a day like that? <laughs> who knows? I mean, I mean, Will Levis is going to put mayonnaise in his coffee. Juice <laughs> Kiffin's going to, I mean, I don't know who knows what Juice Kiffin will do. Carry a shark out to midfield. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen that Dr- day. Drive a Bentley to midfield. There's just no telling what Juice right. will do at that point. Um, all right, so uh, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Ole Miss and Troy at uh, three o'clock on Saturday should be a uh, should be a good game. Should be an interesting game. I, I like Ole Miss to cover. Uh, I think the line's twenty one and a half. I, I think the line's pretty pretty on point. I give Vegas credit here. I think they about nailed that one. So we'll come back uh, next week and we'll uh, review Ole Miss and Troy. We'll have some. We'll be able to look at some things and be able to take a little deeper dive into what happened, what didn't happen, and then we'll look ahead to some degree to Ole Miss and Central Arkansas, which is a 6 p.m. game next Saturday at uh, Vault Hemingway Stadium as Ole Miss gets through this uh, first part of the season and, as we said, gets ready for a final two-month sprint that should be absolutely fascinating. So uh, for Pete DeWeese, I'm Neil McCready. Uh, let me remind you a couple things real quick. I did not take care of a couple things, so let me do it now. Walk On Sports Bistro puts everything they've got into bringing you game day with a taste of Louisiana, watching the game at home, or tailgating in the Grove. Let Walk Ons take care of all of your tailgating needs this season. Inquire today about their family and friends bundles and tailgate platters. You can order online or uh, – at your convenient Walk-Ons app. Visit them today in Oxford or Ridgeland. And uh, also, a word from our sponsor at MPW Digital, uh, BetterHelp. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when facing uh, a challenge in life. When you learn to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. Therapists can help you become a better problem solver, making it easy to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. I've used therapy in the past as a way to handle some stress, negative thoughts, just, uh, I don't know, negativity and all, just kind of just self-doubt. For me, it was a life changer. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient. It's accessible. It's affordable. It's entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, switch therapist anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash MPW today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash MPW. So uh, we will be back, like I said, for next week. We'll tape this again next Wednesday night. Ole Miss getting ready for Central Arkansas. They'll have the Troy game and the books. We'll talk about it with Pete on Pete's Pigskin Preview, brought to you by Walk-On's Sports Bistro. So for Pete, I'm Neil. Uh, enjoy your weekend, stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.